to section 4.2, which is the mean value theorem. The textbook has a lot of theorems in here that we're going to read. Um, I might need to write them down just to make certain that we are all together here. If I can find my camera, that would be nice. I must have closed my camera. As we patiently wait. Thank you, camera. Okay. All right, so this is section 4.2, the mean value theorem. Actually, Rolls theorem is in here also, but they're landing it as calling the mean value theorem. And oddly enough, the first theorem in the book is Rolls theorem. So we're going to start off with what's in the book, which is Rolls theorem, though it's not at all in the title. And this is on page 192. And we can write it, and we're going to read it, and then I'm going to ask you what you think it says. Okay, see if you can translate the theorem into, like, English terms, more or less. Here it is. It says, Suppose that y equals f of x is, a con is continuous at every point in the interval, and differentiable at every point in it. So this is a nice, smooth, continuous, pretty curve. If f of a equals f of b, then there is at least one number c in the interval at which f prime is equals zero. So you have this continuous and differentiable function. Okay, so we can write it. Your function, your f is continuous, meaning no breaks, no vertical asymptotes. It's continuous and differentiable. No cusps. Okay. The function is continuous and differentiable. And then it says, if f of a equals f of b, these are y values, the function values. These are vertical heights of the function, vertical heights of the graph. If f of a equals f of b, that's a b, not a 6, it's a b, the letter b, then, there is at least one number C in that interval A to B, that's not an ordered pair, but that's an interval A, B, at which f prime of c equals zero. Okay, let's discuss this for a second. Okay, so there's some number c, some x value c in the interval where the first derivative equals zero. So what does that mean? If the first derivative equals zero, what's going on there? Right, your tangent line is horizontal, so it's probably a local max or a local min, right? Okay. So there's a local max for a local min going on here. And it says there's going to be a local max for a local min if f of a equals f of b, meaning the height of the function is same at two points in the interval. So let's visualize this. If we have a function, and suppose this is a, and suppose this is b. So if f of a is a height of 2, and say f of b is a height of 2, then it says that some value c in here, the first derivative of the function is going to be 0, or it's going to have a horizontal asymptote somewhere in there. Okay, So that means either the function is going to go up and back down, which would give me a, ver a horizontal asymptote at c, right? Or it could go down and back up and have a horizontal asymptote of C. But if your function starts at a vertical height and then it's fooling around and then it comes back to that vertical height and it's continuous and it's differentiable, it has no breaks, no vertical asymptotes, it's not doing anything weird, okay? Then if it starts at a height and it goes back to the same height, then somewhere in there that function turned and it's going to have a local max or local min where the first derivative equals zero. And that's what Rolle's theorem is trying to tell you. Is that logical now? Are you kind of, can you see, can you see it in terms of English instead of in terms of calculus, more or less? Do you see the reasoning, the concept? It's really pretty simple. 
Your vertical height starts here. It returns to here. It can have two or three of them in here. This graph can be going crazy so long as it's smooth and continuous and differentiable. But when it returns to the same height, at some point it went up and down or down and up, which would have given me a place for the horse, where you would have had a horizontal tangent line. So that's what Rolle's theorem is saying. It's kind of fun. Okay, now let's take a look at the mean value theorem. Well, when you think in math about a mean value, what do you think? An average. That's right, an average. So this is going to talk a little bit about the average rate of change. And this theorem in the textbook is on page 193. And here's what it looks like. It says, suppose y equals f of x is continuous on a closed interval and differentiable. Okay, so again, they're setting us up with a pretty curve. There's no cusps, there's no vertical asymptotes, there's no holes in the graph, there's no bakes in the graph, there's no problems. It's nice and smooth and everything's happy. Okay, so then it says, then there is at least one point C in the interval, not an ordered pair, but in the interval between A and B, at which the difference quotient will equal the first derivative at C. Okay, let me write it down, because you're going to need this written down. Okay, so again, we're going to start off, think of that F is continuous and differentiable. Okay, so they're guaranteeing me that this is a nice, pretty function. It doesn't have any major issues in this area. So then it says, if it's a function that's continuous and differentiable, then then there is at least one point one point along the curve one point where the x value equals c in this interval between a and b at which f of b minus f of a over b minus a equals f prime at c. All right, let's try to visualize this one. Okay, suppose your function's doing something like this. Here's your interval from a to b. And suppose your function comes in and it looks something like that. So this point right here and this point right here, this ordered pair would be A, F of A, and this point would be B, F of B. So what is F of B minus F of A over B minus A? What is that ratio? The slope of what? Okay. It's the slope of this line between these two points right here, right? Okay. So it's saying something about the slope of this line between these two endpoints on this interval. It's got something to say about the slope of that line. And it says the slope of that line equals F prime at C, where C is a number between A and B. So what does that mean? C is some number between A and B. So that the first derivative at C equals the slope of that dashed line. Okay, maybe it's right here. Why in the world is Miss Zachary drawing a couple of parallel lines <laughs> and calling this point right here C? Okay. Here's the F of B minus F A over B minus A is this line, right? Which is the slope of this line. 
How do you figure the slope of this line? Isn't it the first derivative of the function at C? Isn't that the slope of the tangent line? Isn't the slope of this line f prime at C? And doesn't it equal the derivative of the line between A and B? Okay, so what they're saying, <laughs> you're all giving me blank looks, okay? <laughs> the bulb is not light. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, what does it say? Is it the slope between the endpoints, the slope of the, the line between the two endpoints? There has to be a tangent line to this curve who will have the same slope as the slope of the, of the line between the two endpoints. Okay? The slope of the line between the two endpoints must equal the slope of a tangent line somewhere in that region. Okay? The slope of the line between the two endpoints must equal the slope of the tangent line somewhere in that region. And it can happen more than once. Here it's happening at a C value here. It might would happen again, maybe up in here somewhere. I might could get another slope of a tangent line equivalent to the slope between the two endpoints. Here's another one. So there's two places, at least two places, that C could exist in this interval because C could also happen here. There's two places in that interval where the slope of the tangent line equals the slope between the two endpoints. So the slope of the tangent line equals the slope between the endpoints. Right, they're going to give you an interval to play in between A and B. So they're giving you a limited interval to play in. So maybe this function, maybe there is some function defined. It's doing some wild stuff outside of this interval. But within this interval, it's continuous, it's differentiable, and therefore there better be a tangent line with a slope equivalent to the slope between the two endpoints. Over there, you know, right here, it's okay. <laughs> okay. So the slope of the tangent line equals the slope between the endpoints. Another way of writing this, the slope of the tangent line we refer to as instantaneous slope, right? Instantaneous slope or instantaneous rate of change is the slope of the tangent line. And the slope between the endpoints we would refer to as the average rate of change, right? Because average rate of change is where you just go to the slope formula and do the y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Remember this from test one? So really, it's where your average rate of change between the two endpoints equals the slope of the tangent line. And it can happen in more than one place in the interval. That's what the mean value theorem is telling us. Okay, so... so do what? What? If you're driving, mm -hmm. you That's right. Speed at one point. Like, if you take your average speed going somewhere, Mm -hmm. You have to go that average speed. At the Somewhere in the middle. Place. That's right. And we talked about that a little bit, it seems like. Talking about when I'm driving with my kids, okay, the average rate of speed on this long trip is, like, lousy because you, yeah, because you compare how many times i got to stop, take kids to the bathroom or whatever, okay. But say, say my average was 55 miles per hour when the speed limit was 70, you know, or even less than that kind of thing. So somewhere in there, I'm revving the engine to, from a stopping, you know, from being stopped at McDonald's or whatever. To get to 70, I cross that 55 mile per hour run, that 55 mile velocity. And every time I stopped, I had to slow down. So there was many places that I hit that same speed, which was the average rate. <laughs> And then the cop pulls me over and says, you're going one mile per hour over the speed limit. And I said, and you are out of your mind. It hasn't happened to you. <laughs> what? That hasn't happened to you. Yet. Oh, yeah. It was last, it just happened to me over? recently. Yeah, I was going 71. No, he didn't. <laughs> I think he was sleeping. <laughs> I think he was really tired. No, no, he did not. I was the only one on the road. 
I think he was just really bored. I think he was sleepy. It was like at 11.30 at night, and he was probably bored. And he thought, I'll just pull her over for the fun of it. <laughs> okay. Now there's a couple of corollaries, which we really aren't going to have any homework on, but it's another one of those things to try to see if you can understand what it's saying more than anything else. And this corollary is on page 195. And it's called Corollary 1. Here it is. Okay, it says if f prime of x equals 0 at each point in the interval, which means the slope of the tangent line is always 0 <laughs> between a and b. If the slope of the tangent line is always 0 between a and b, then f of x must equal a constant. Right? Now, does that make sense? Let's see. If f prime of x equals 0, that means your horizontal, your tangent line is always horizontal. So that means if you have an x value equal to a and x value equal to b, and you have a line where the, the tangent line is always horizontal, wouldn't you have to have a horizontal line? That would be the only way that your first derivative always equals 0, that your tangent line to the curve was always horizontal, would be if you had a horizontal line. It's the only way it's going to happen. So what is the name of a horizontal line? If it's at a height of 3, the name of that line is y equaling 3. If your line is a height of 1, right, the name of the line is y equaling 1. So when they say if f prime of x equals 0, then in the whole interval, then f of x must equal c which would be like f of x equaling 3, f of x equals a number, f of x equaling 1. That's the name of a horizontal line. So anytime your original function is a horizontal line, the first derivative of the function is always going to be 0 because the, first, the tangent line is always going to be horizontal and the slope of the tangent line is 0, meaning that your graph must be a horizontal line. So it's a really simple statement, but they're really trying to get you to understand the concept and then this next corollary is, is different. It took me a minute. I looked and I thought, what in the world are they doing now? Okay, and corollary two on this same page, y'all don't worry about this, but they do a very good job of explaining it actually. It says, if f prime of x equals g prime of x, so you have two functions, you have an f of x and a g of x, so you've got two graphs out there. And it's saying the first derivative of the graphs are always equal, meaning the slopes of the tangent lines are always the same on these two graphs. <laughs> then there must exist some constant between the two functions. Okay, so in other words, let's look at this. They really do a good job here. Look at all these lines, right? If the red one's f of x equaling x squared, the next one is x squared plus 1, x squared plus 2, x squared minus 1, x squared minus 2. These are translations up and down of the x squared function. If you look at the slope of the tangent line along this graph, here the tangent line is 0, here the tangent line has a slope of 0, here the tangent line has a slope of 0. Here the slope of the tangent line is something like 1, it's something like 1, it's something like 1. So the slopes of the tangent lines are equal at every x value for every one of these functions which means if you just take your function and put a translation, a vertical translation by sliding it up or sliding it down, then the values of the first derivatives will always be equal at every x value in the interval. So that's kind of cool. They don't ask any questions about it, though. There's none of that in the homework. It's just kind of interesting. It's just kind of neat. Okay, so after we've finally done all this, then we get to some examples where we actually get to apply all this lovely knowledge and all of you look like you're zoning. <laughs> okay, so we'll work one example and then we'll take a break. And then we'll come back and work more examples. Okay, so let's finally do something. We've been studying all these theorems and all these lovely corollaries and enough is enough. Okay, here's what the question is going to say. It's going to say find the values 
of C, and C is just a number, that satisfy the equation f of b minus f of a over b minus a equaling f prime of c. Okay, so in other words, find the x value in the interval so that the slope between the two endpoints, which would be referred to as the average rate of change, equals the slope of the tangent line. Okay, so this is going back to the mean value theorem. Okay, so it's saying, if I can find all the notes that I had just taken for you guys, here they are. It's saying, according to the mean value theorem, find the x value such that the slope between the endpoints equals the instantaneous rate of change or the slope at a point. Okay, so find the x value that gives you the tangent line, the slope of the tangent line equal to the slope between the two endpoints. That is the question at hand. Okay, and here is the function. And here is the interval. So you're looking for the slope of two things. You're looking for the average rate of change, which is the slope between the points when x is 0 and when x is 1. These are your endpoints, your slope between the endpoints. Okay, first of all, you're looking for the slope between the endpoints, which is the f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So this is what the point 0, when you put an x value of 0 in, you get 1. When you put an x value of 1 in, this is 1 squared plus 2 plus 1. 1 plus 2 plus 1 is 4, right? So the slope between the two endpoints, which is the f of b minus f of a over b minus a. I can even write that. f of b minus f of a over b minus a equals 4 minus 1 over 1 minus 0, which is 3. So the average rate of change, or the slope of the line between the endpoints of this graph, is 3. Now, we want to find where the first derivative equals 3, which means where the slope of the tangent line will equal 3. So now, we take the first derivative of our function, x squared plus 2x plus 1. That first derivative is 2x plus 2. We want the first derivative, the slope of the tangent line, to equal the slope between the endpoints. Okay, so this is the slope of the tangent line. We want, again, the slope of the tangent line to equal the slope between the two endpoints. So that means to take this 2x plus 2 and set it equal to 3. Your f prime of c equaling f b minus f a over b minus a. Find that x value. So now 2x equals 1, x equals 1 half. So when x equals 1 half, the slope of the tangent line at x equals 1 half will equal 3, which is also the slope of the line between the endpoints. So the value of c for which the mean value theorem holds true or is satisfied is when x equals 1 half. Is that logical at all, or are you just watching me do the algebra? <laughs> um, I wonder if I could graph this and help it to make a little more sense. Oh, why can't, there's my mouse. If I go back to this lovely calculator, maybe I could do this. I'm not certain. Let's see what happens. Man, this, come on, the Y menu, the sleepy thing. Okay, so this is X squared plus 2X plus 1. X squared plus 2X plus 1. We are looking between 0 and 1, so I'm going to do a zoom. Remember, this window is all crazy. Standard. Get back up there. 
there is the parabola. And we're looking between the points 0 and 1. Maybe I should do a zoom decimal. We're looking between here and here, which means the slope between these two endpoints is equal to the slope of the tangent line at one half. So let me see if I can try to sketch this on my camera. So you have this parabola that looks something like this in this region and when x is a half the slope of the tangent line at that point is equivalent to the slope of the tangent line between those two endpoints. That's what the mean value theorem says. It's not very fancy on that one, but that's what it's trying to say. Trying to say. Okay, and I'm going to lie to you. I'm going to work one more example. It's not very long. Okay, same thing. Find the value or values of C such that the slope between the endpoints f of b minus f of a over b minus a equals the instantaneous slope or the slope of the tangent line within the interval. And then they give me the function f of x equaling the square root of x minus 1 between the points 1 and 3. Okay, so to find the difference quotient, we need to find the endpoints, so, or the slope between the endpoints. So the two points are when x is 1 and when x is 3. When x is 1, this is the square root of 1 minus 1, which is 0. When x is 3, this is the square root of 3 minus 1, which is the square root of 2. So the slope between the endpoints, which we used to talk about as the average rate of change, is the square root of 2 minus 0 over 3 minus 1, which is the square root of 2 over 2. So the slope between the endpoints of the line is square root of 2 over 2, which is equal to the f of b minus f of a over b minus a. That's the left side. The right side is to find f prime of c so that it equals the square root of 2 over 2. Okay, so let's figure out what f prime of x is. If f of x is the square root of x plus 1, then f prime of x equals something. I need to change this then. I'm going to rewrite this as x minus 1 to the 1 half power. So when I come down here to find the first derivative, this is the chain rule, it's going to be 1 half times x minus 1 to the negative 1 half times the derivative inside the parentheses, which is the derivative of x is 1. So this is just 1 over 2 times the square root of x minus 1. So this is your first derivative. This is like your f prime of c. You want these two to be equal to each other. So you set them equal. You set them equal. I don't know. Man, i got this heart-shaped thing going on here. Okay. So then set them equal. Your difference quotient or your average rate of change is square root of 2 over 2 equaling 1 over 2 square root of x minus 1, your first derivative. That is, your, this is your f of b minus f of a over b minus a equaling your f prime of c. This is your setup. So now how do I solve this? Cross multiply, 2 times 1 is 2. And then you have 2 times the square root of 2 times the square root of x minus 1. Divide both sides by 2, you get 1 equaling the square root of 2 times the square root of x minus 1. One over square root of two equals the square root of x minus one. Square both sides, which sometimes causes problems. But if you square both sides, 
you get one half over equaling x minus one So one half plus one equals x, or three halves equals x. So the place where the slope of the line between the endpoints and the slope of the tangent line are equal is when x equals three halves. Okay, I'm going to pause the recording. Y'all can take a break before we move on. Okay, so let's continue in this lovely section, 4.2. Now that y'all have had a break and y'all should be sharp. Y'all shouldn't be kind of zoning when I look at you, like, you know, the what in the world I'm talking about. <laughs> just write it down. She's talking, just write it down. Okay. okay, here's what this next question says. It says, does the function... satisfy the hypothesis of the mean value theorem. Okay, what in the world are they asking? Does the function satisfy the hypothesis of the mean value theorem? What this question says is before you can apply the mean value theorem, your function has to be continuous and differentiable. So really what this question says is, is the function continuous and differentiable? Because if it's not continuous and differentiable, you cannot apply the mean value theorem. So the hypothesis of the mean value theorem is that you first start with a nice function that's continuous and differentiable. And so they give you a function to make this a nice little challenge. They give you a function that's a little harder. And in fact, they give you a piecewise function. And so you have to look at this piecewise function and say, is this piecewise function continuous and differentiable? Continuous meaning no holes, no vertical asymptotes. Um, no breaks, and differentiable meaning no cusps. Um, what else is there? No cusps, no breaks, no holes for it to be differentiable. Okay, so again, I need to emphasize, when you have a piecewise function, the problems are going to happen at these interval endpoints, which are called the parameters. That's where you have to be really careful. So in other words, we want to be thinking, I wonder what in the world is going on at negative 1, because that's where we switch functions in the definition of the piecewise function. So I wonder what in the world is going on. Is there a hole there? Do they meet there? Is there a break in the graph there? You know, that's where I'm having to be careful. So let's think about negative 1. At x equaling negative 1, the first half of the function, when your function value is x squared minus x, f of negative 1 equals negative 1 squared minus negative 1, which is 2. So the height of the function coming in from the left side is a vertical height of 2. Coming in from the right side, the function value is the 2x squared minus the 3x minus 3. So I wonder what its height is at negative 1. It's 2 times negative 1 squared minus 3 times negative 1 minus 3. So it's 2 plus 3 minus 3, which is 2. So these guys are the same. So their vertical heights, where you kind of change functions, are the same. So that's good. That means there's no break in the graph. They both have a height of 2. Now, I wonder what it looks like. Here's where I would graph it. Okay, let's think about x squared minus x. If x is negative 1, we said the height is 2 for both of them. Okay, so for the x squared minus x, it's only going between negative 2 and negative. The only time I'm equal to x squared minus x is between a negative 2 and a negative 1, this one little bitty interval in here. 
So when x is negative 2, this is negative 2 squared, which is 4, minus a negative 2, which is plus 2, so it's 4 plus 2, so it's a height of 6 over here. So this is what, this is the x squared minus x part of the function between a negative 2 and a negative 1, filled circles on each end. Now, the other one is 2x squared minus 3x minus 3. We already determined that its height is 2 at a value of negative 1. I wonder what its height is at 0, because it's only defined between negative 1 and 0. So at 0, what is its height? Negative 3, right here. Kind of like this, because it's concave up. It looks, I'm not certain, that might be a cusp there. Not, that might be a cusp, okay? Uh, so something is happening there at negative 1. So it's continuous. With this graph, we confirm that between negative 2 and 0, and we're only going between negative 2 and 0, we have continuity. We're good here. It is continuous. That looks fair. We've got that happening. So it's, it's confirming that it is continuous in this interval. Now the question is, is it differentiable, which means, oh dear, I wonder if that's a cusp at negative 1. Well, to determine if it's negative 1, we want to compare the slope of the first derivative to the left and to the right, because if there's a huge change in the, trope of the, in the slope of the tangent line coming from the left and coming from the right, then it's not smooth and continuous, or not smooth and differentiable. So what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the first, evaluate the first derivative of the function for the function on the left and the function on the right at 1. So, if f of x equals x squared minus x, f prime of x is 2x minus 1, and f prime at negative 1 would be 2 times negative 1 minus 1, which is a negative 3. That's the left side. That means the slope of the tangent line coming in from the left in here, it has a slope like of negative 3. Now let's come in from the other side. Let's look at the other function. When f of x is the 2x squared minus 3x minus 3, the first derivative is 4x minus 3, and the slope of the, or the slope of the tangent line, or the first derivative evaluated at, I should have put a negative 1, would be 4 times negative 1 minus 3, which is a negative 7. Whoa! So it's a dramatic change in the slope of the tangent lines at that point. It doesn't smoothly kind of slide over from being a negative 7 to a negative 3. So since the slope of the tangent lines are so different at that location, this function, that's a cusp. So not differentiable at x equaling negative 1. So it, we got the continuity to happen, but we did not get the differentiability. So we do not meet the hypothesis of the mean value theorem. We got the continuity, but we did not get it differentiable, so this one does not meet the hypothesis of the mean value theorem. Conclude. Does not meet... hypothesis, which means cannot apply mean value theorem to this function in that region. That's a really interesting question. It's a very good question. I wish I could fit it all on the camera at one time, but it just won't fit. So I hope your notes are good. <laughs> okay. All right, let's try another one. Four. Same question. Does it meet the hypothesis? Does the function... meet the hypothesis 
of the mean value theorem, a hypothesis of the mean value theorem, which is the same question of are we continuous, is the function continuous and differentiable on the interval given. So no holes, no breaks, um, no dramatic change like at the cusp. Okay, so here's another one. This one is f of x equaling 2x minus 3, and then 6x minus x squared minus 7. So you're changing from a linear graph, a straight line, 2x minus 3, to a concave parabola, 6x minus x squared minus 7. And this is between 0 and 2 and 2 and 3. So your interval is only between 0 and 3. So the minute you see that, the two graphs, or the graph of the linear changes to the graph of the parabola at an x value of 2. So I'm concerned at x equaling 2. <coughs> Careful at x equaling 2. That's where I'm, I'm care something's happening. This is a linear graph that has no issues. This is a parabola that has no issues. But man, where they meet, are they meeting such that we're still continuous and differentiable? Okay, so at, when f of x equals the 2x minus 3, f of an x value of 2 is 2 times 2 minus 3, which is 4 minus 3 is 1. So the height of the function coming in from the left side is 1. When you look at the right side, which is the parabola, when you consider it, it as an x value of 2, it better equal 1. It better have the same height or there's a break in the graph there. Well, this is 6 times 2 minus 2 squared minus 7, which is 12, minus 4, which is 8, minus 7 is 1. So this is good. This worked. So there is no hole in the graph or break in the graph at an x value of 2. So we have continuity. Okay, because at the x value of 2, everything was smooth. They filled the hole and there was no break. We had the same vertical height from the left as from the right. Now let's check differentiability. Okay, so the first function is 2x minus 3, so the first derivative is 2. Okay, it's a linear graph. Its first derivative is always going to be 2. Okay, the slope of the line is never changing, so the value of the slope of the tangent line is never changing. The second half on the right side is 6x minus x squared minus 7. So its first derivative is 6 minus 2x. Now that first derivative at that concerning point of 2 is going to be 6 minus 2 times 2, which is 6 minus 4, which is 2. So are the first derivatives the same? They are. So we are also differentiable so this one does meet the hypothesis it is it it the mean value theorem can be applied I graphed this one, and if you graph it between 0, 1, 2, 3, if you were to graph it, 2x minus 3 between, it'd be down here, 1, 2, 3 here, and when x is 2, it'd be 1. So it looks like this. And then between 2 and 3, it's a parabola that comes kind of up and down. So it's smooth. It makes it. Okay, That's what it looks like. The hole is filled at 2. The slope of the tangent line coming from the left and the right are consistent. So it is differentiable and continuous. So it does meet the standards. Now the next one is most interesting. And you have a homework question on this one. So you need to be pretty solid coming into this next question. Which would be 
Number five. This is a very interesting question. I love this one. Very creative on this one. Where did I get this question? There it is. Okay. <laughs> it's number 14 here on page 197. And it says, for what values of A, M, and B does this following piecewise function satisfy the hypothesis of the mean value theorem on the interval between 0 and 2? So what the question is, is figure out the value of A, the value of M, and the value of B, such that this function, this piecewise function, is continuous and differentiable from 0 to 2. So, somebody has hiccups out there. It's about to drive you crazy, isn't it? <laughs> oh, so it doesn't bother me. It's probably about to drive you crazy. Okay, 3 and negative x squared plus 3x plus a and then mx plus b. And this is when x equals 0. This is when 0 is less than x, which is less than 1. And this is where 1 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2. And so we want to find the value for a, the value for m, and the value for b such that this function meets the hypothesis of being continuous and differentiable. These are always really fun. Okay, so you have a horizontal line at a height of 3 coming in. And then you have, well, actually, just a height of three. Then you have a parabola who's concave down. And then you have a linear graph. And you're looking at an x value of zero and an x value of one where these guys better meet up and the circle better be filled. So you don't have a break or you don't have an empty circle. Okay, so between the, between the top two equations, okay, between these first two, at an x value of zero, this one better have a height of 3 in order for them to be in agreement, right? This function better have a height of 3 in order for there not to be a break in the graph. And I don't know whether it's differentiable or not, I don't care. But just to check continuity, this function has to have a height of 3 when x is 0. So when x equals 0, comma, Negative x squared plus 3x plus a must equal a height of 3. Okay, so put the 0 in and set it equal to 3. So negative 0 squared plus 3 times 0 plus a has to equal 3. So what does a equal? 3 to make it continuous. The height of this function has to equal 3 at x equaling 0. So here's what we have now. We have the 3. We have a negative x squared plus a 3x plus 3 now and an mx plus b. Okay, so now the issue is what's going on here at 1? What's the story here when x is 1? Okay, when x equals 1, negative x squared plus 3x plus 3 equals what? Equals a height of 5. So, therefore...
when x equals 1, mx plus b better also equal 5, right? If you put an x value of 1 in, you get a 5. So if the height of the middle function is 5 when x is 1, that mx plus b has to also be a height of 5 at 1. Okay? So when x equals 1, mx plus b must equal 5. Well, if x is 1, this means that m plus b is 5, right? Now, we still have two unknowns, m and b. How in the world are we going to get this? Well, all we've really been talking about so far is continuity. In other words, fill in the holes. Now we've got to watch for the same slope for them to be differentiable. Okay, so now we're going to play with the slope stuff for differentiability to see if we can come up with these valuables. These values, these valuables. <laughs> these valuable values, okay. All right, so if our function on the left side is negative x squared plus 3x plus 3, its first derivative is a negative 2x plus 3. So its first derivative value at 1, which is the slope of its tangent line at an x value of 1, is a negative 2 times 1 plus 3, which is 1. So it has a slope of its tangent line is 1 when x is 1. So the slope of the tangent line of mx plus b better also be 1 when x is 1, right? There you go. What is the slope of mx plus b? <laughs> it's m, right? Okay. The slope of mx plus b is m. So m must equal 1. So here we got m now. So if m equals 1, then up here we have 1 plus b equals 5 or b equals 4. Now we have them all. We have continuity and differentiability. And so now the answer to the question is, for this piecewise function to, be, to meet the hypothesis of mean value theorem, meaning for this function to be differentiable and continuous, it equals 3 when x is 0. It equals a negative x squared plus 3x plus 3 when x is between 0 and 1. And equals a 1x plus 4 when 1 is less than or equal to x and less than or equal to 2. Fun stuff. Okay. Pretty neat stuff. And we have finally ended this section, and we need to move on to the next section. And I think you're going to like the next section better. It doesn't have quite so much concept in it.